and I guess we can get started. I'm basically going to try to work on this book area right here, which I painted a base in this blue, blue tone because I wanted to put a cool color to contrast all this warmth. But in the end, this book will be like a brown tone with like little blue highlights and blue showing through. So this is generally how I start something like this. I go very rough. As you can see, it's not all perfectly smooth because I want it to be like an old book and have texture to it. So I want it to look like a book you might've got at a thrift store or something that was sitting on your grandparents' shelf and has all kind of mysterious, hidden, cool stories inside of it. So Roger wants to know if this is a commission. This is a commission. Yes, to answer your question. Clayton wants to know, how do I get a hold of one of the best paintings I've ever seen, dude? You should be a tattoo artist of your, your style is sick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I have done tattoos in the past, but it's only on friends of mine who have tattooed me because they always have the set up. And I used to hang out at a lot of different tattoo shops with my friends who were tattooers and they'd, end of the day they'd be like hey great do you want to get tattooed and I was never one to say no to a tattoo so that's pretty much why I have so many tattoos and since they were my friends they would set up their machines for me and I would tattoo them and they'd get a very very painful tattoo with shaky lines and all that but the shading would usually be spot on wow. um, oh, oh you got more questions yes Rowley wants to know, how do you decide what name to sign your paintings? How has your signature changed or evolved? Do you keep changing it? That's a really good question about um, signatures. I, I used to, you know, try to figure out what my signature was going to be. And it took, you know, a couple years to really nail it down. It used to, I used to sign stuff as Crayola. And then I decided that's probably not what I want to do for the long term. And then I would sign, like, all my paintings as G. Simpkins. But now I sign my Princess G. Simpkins with a certain signature and my paintings as just Simpkins. Um, I probably should know that down too. My wife probably wants to battle me on this one. <laughs> but there's just a signature for Prince and all that that just works and flows so nicely. And I, that, that same signature doesn't look right on the paintings. I want a nice, clean, crisp Simpkins on all the paintings. So I, I usually do real straight block letters that say Simpkins on all my paintings. So we have a couple um, people with this same question. Okay. Um, coming from Mike, Kelly, um, Lori. They want to know how long does a piece like this take to paint approximately? This is the number one question I get asked and I've answered it in previous videos. I always tell everybody it takes me 45 years to finish one of these paintings. Just, you know, I'm joking because it's taken me like a lifetime to figure out how to paint you know, the speed I do, um, whether it's fast or not. Um, and every painting has a different life of its own, so it's hard to gauge. It's not a simple answer to any of these, because this painting, um, at its size, you know, there's not one way to say, oh, it takes, you know, two weeks, it takes a month, it takes one day, because there, there's so much small detail in this painting that it could take, you know, a couple weeks, because I want to stay in and give enough attention to each small area. But at the same time, if a painting this size was like a, a bird study or like a bird head or something ab more abstract, it could be done in a couple days. So it really depends on how much small detail is in there because the small details, it really takes up all the time. And I generally don't really clock my time on any of my paintings. And sometimes I forget how long they take. Like usually I can gauge how long a painting took me by the amount of audio books I listened to while painting it and kind of go, well, that audio book was seven hours and this one was 14 hours and stuff like that. But every painting has its own lifespan. So it's really, it's really hard for me to answer. That's why sometimes I don't answer it in the comments, but I wish I could. I just don't remember how long certain ones took me and I've never ever been one to clock them. I don't think that, you know, I, I just think people should make a, a point to take their time on their paintings and be patient with them and, and, and don't try to gauge yourself against how long somebody else took to paint because I might be able to paint faster than you because I do this all day every single day but doesn't mean that's the speed it should go. You might have some hacks that you can go faster or, or just maybe you should slow down a little bit if you think that maybe you're rushing your paintings. 
looking tired. Juan wants to know, when you layer color over, does everything get darker? The value, I mean? Um, generally, yeah. You're going to knock down your highlights when you layer color over it. But then the fun thing is, with acrylics, you're going to come right back and pop those highlights back in, over it. And when that dries, you're going to layer more color over it. Then you can pop back more highlights. You do a series of these thin layers from highlight to transparent to highlight to transparent. And the next thing you know, you got some really rich colors popping through and um, it makes it more interesting. Roger Hurtado wants to know, how much input do you allow the client to have once the general concept is determined? If you generally, with, with uh, commissions, um, we'll ask the client to choose from a variety of my different um, styles. Uh, and different paintings and see what they like and then from that point we narrow it down and say so something like this you're saying and they'll say yes or no and I'm like well, well I have these ideas I'd like to do that's similar to that is there a couple elements maybe I can fit in like an old antique or something that means something special to you and we'll go from there I generally like wouldn't take just something really random like I've had people ask me can you do a painting on war and I would say so do you want a tank? Do you want like a bomber plane? No, just like war. And I'm like, I don't really know exactly what you have in mind or envision. It's kind of abstract and it's not really going to fit within my realm. And I generally won't work on something like that. But when it comes to, you know, people usually approach me for a commission. It's usually along the lines of, I liked it when you did that piece. Would you do something along that line in that world? And that's generally where we go with commissions. GCBegin81 wants to know, how do you paint your water splash effects? Oh, I'll show you. So the water splash effects, uh, I usually use an old paintbrush. Let me find it. So like this one, you'll see like all the bristles are kind of worn through. I'll water down a little bit of the color uh, paint that I do the splash effect with. And I'll come through, I'll flick it. Like you can see all these splashes. These were all just flick, flick, flick. Then I'll come back with a dry brush, or maybe a slightly damp brush, and I'll brush through the bottoms of it and blend around to get it smooth. And then I come back, you know, let it dry, and I can either tint it, like this was all like a lighter color, but I tint it with yellow iron oxide. Because I know I'm gonna come back through and probably put like a key coming out of the book. I don't want it to be super bright compared to what's gonna come in next. But it's generally just, I flick off an old Brush. So your brushes have a long lifespan to them. Like I keep all these, even when they start getting all weird on me, they still have some good purposes. So yeah, it's simple. It's like flicking a toothbrush. Okay. Victor A. Vegas wants to know, how do I paint cracks and walls, uh -oh. especially brick walls, to make it look realistic? How do you make it look like a wall? You're going to want to take, like, can you guys see this canvas right here? The blank one? Yeah. We can see half of it. Do you see where my finger is right Yes. Here? Okay. So I would, if you want to do like a brick wall, here's, here's the fat, a point that you're going to want for everything that you're working on. Keep two brushes in hand. Keep one that's either wet or dry, wet or, or slightly damp, and then keep your one that you load the paint on. So I'm going to put the paint down here, make a line, and then I come through and you blend out edges. If I start putting down like a wet line, a darker line to put a crack in a wall. I'm gonna immediately follow it up with either a slightly damp brush, and I'm gonna pull the line, and you kinda of get that shadow of where the crack's gonna be. And then you come back in and you can darken portions of it, you really get that look of a crack and the shadow it would create. Because the illusion is you're going to have the crack where it's lifted, it'll be sharp, and the shadow will be like what's behind, it'll be shadowing what's behind it. So you really just want to do you, it like shadow. Can you move that canvas over to the right so people can see? Um, is that there better? We go. Yeah. And then you can manipulate that crack with that second brush. I always keep two brushes with me, or more. One to put the line down, one to blend the edge.
There you go. So yeah, it's just a, it's just a series of that. Let it drive and come back and reapply the craft edges. But I think one of the main tools you're going to have is to always have that second brush with you. It's kind of like when I'm painting, I, 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 if I want to paint something solid, I'll, I'll base in the color. And then to make something look like it's blending, I'm never really doing wet into wet. I'm not painting this blue with a little bit darker blue to get that shadow. I wait till that dries. I put in the darker tone. Change brushes. I put in the darker tone here with this brush that come through and I blend the edge off. And it's basically, I'm, I'm not, you know, it's a little bit wet paint. Let me put a little bit, not so wet. I'm not really blending the paint into the paint. I'm just blending the edge off this top layer. So it makes it look like it's blending into the other, like it had been painted wet to wet, but it never was. It's on its own layer, dry, and I'm just blending the edge off so you get that gradient. William Garcia wants to know, what has been your most difficult painting so far and why? Oh gosh, I think all the paintings are difficult. Small ones are more difficult just because you have to pack so much detail into them and it's hard to like if you do one misstroke like if you're painting a face oh there goes a whole face or or there goes a whole boot whatever i'm working on but most difficult might have been let the outside in that giant piece there's a video of it on my youtube page and there's so much so much content in it so many characters and trying to get their tones right like they're all in the same room like they're all in the same world have all the colors talk to each other that was pretty difficult, but really challenging and fun at the same time. So difficult usually equals fun for me. I like to challenge myself with every painting and try to learn something new. So Let the Outside In was probably the most difficult, but I really enjoyed the things I learned from it. I want to apply it to new things. A lot of the challenge is getting the colors to talk to each other. So I'm working on this painting. I'm pulling all the colors from the background and doing transparent layers after I paint this area right up here was like turquoise and light grays. I came through with a, a transparent like wash of like a rust color and I washed the areas to make the shadows and I built in the wooden cuts into it with that color just to, to have it knock down that bright turquoise I had in there to make it more of the colors of the world and the atmosphere that it's in. Rally Stewart, who previously had asked about uh, signing your paintings and your work, had a follow-up question uh -huh. about, you know, how does signing your work affect the value over time? I constantly struggle with how to sign my name. Wait, what's his last name? Stewart. Uh, if you saw, uh, I would just keep it very consistent. Like, is it R. Stewart? It could be, yeah. That sounds like Rod, Rod Stewart, but that's still kind of funny. You could do R. Stewart because it's kind of in people's brain in the deck. But I, would, I wouldn't have think there's anything wrong with just signing R. Stewart. That kind of makes sense. Yeah, and also just, right, like finding a way where, um, you know, when you sign it, it's something that you can do... Um, quickly but where it's clear that the buyer or collector can clearly see that it's yours right right like it's make it readable that's your brand and that is that what does affect your value because if you have several different signatures all across your body of work um, and there's no consistency like Greg has established a consistency you know in signing originals versus prints and that's okay but um, if you find something that is you know, consistent. I mean, that's really, that's your brand. Somebody looks at it and knows, hey, that's that's a Rally Stewart piece. Well, I have a, a good story on signing stuff. I've told it before in here, but maybe you guys haven't heard it. I was signing um, prints at Dragon Con, which is a convention in Atlanta, and Stan Lee was at my booth, and we were signing together for about an hour and a half. A print I'd done, uh, what, like a Spider-Man print with Daredevil, and then he came to sign it with me because I had him in the painting. I painted him in the window. And it was actually a painting I'd done for a commemorative show for Stan Lee. So I had a really good long chat with him. 
and he was teasing me about my signature because my print signature is a little bit messier. And he slapped me and said, why is your signature so messy? You want it to stand out. You want people to be able to read it. And he was clowning me a bit. It was really funny. It was a great moment. But he made a lot of sense with it. And I make sure that all my paintings have a nice, clean, crisp Simpkins at the bottom. All right. I'm going to just, I'm going to scroll back up just to see if I've missed any other questions. We still have some more. Um, Juan wants to know, how did you land on the light source coming from directly ahead? Um, that came from, I, that really, I believe, came from, like, back when I was doing a lot of graffiti. And I always wanted to have my 3Ds on my letters going a certain way. And the light would be behind and above. And then the dark shadows in the, the 3D would go a certain way. And I always painted my, like when I started doing like 3D graffiti letters, I wanted that light source to pop. And I noticed, wow, this, these really pop like that. And it kind of just naturally transferred to my, my pop surrealism paintings without me even noticing or, or thinking about it. It just was something kind of natural. And I just like the way it showcases the items in the painting. So I just kind of stuck with it. It didn't feel like it was broke. I didn't want to fix it. But I do experiment with other light sources, mostly in my drawings and stuff like that. And it's fun to branch out and, and learn more about different light sources. But there is something I do really love about doing it the way that I do. Anna Aurora wants to know, do you find a lot of inspiration from early comics from the 1880s to 1930s? Ooh, I don't know about the years. I, I have books on old fairy tales that have the illustrations in it. And uh, namely, there's this one book, I forget the title, the, the cover's coming off, I've read it so many times, but the illustrations are so beautiful. And it's all just like Aesop's Fables and Grimm's Fairy Tales. And that's probably one of my favorite inspiring things that I love like old fairy tales are some of my best um, influential things I pull from Art of Loy Loy wants to know what's your favorite go-to brush and size for super tight line work like eyelashes etc oh, okay I got this one right here is a zero I believe it's a round and or a liner and then I have a script brush right here which is also a piece of zero liner and a zero script these two the come in handy for a lot of things like lashes and stuff i don't think the camera's just... picking it up unless there's a delay there's a delay okay yeah so it's going to come through i believe there's a delay okay so these brushes it'll pop up in a second okay. oh i think it's no yeah, it'll pop up in a second <laughs> gosh i didn't know there's a delay i know sorry for delay folks <laughs> hopefully you all We'll be able to see. Where did where did you get those brushes? Oh, oh the brushes are from Trekel.com. It's T R E K E L L dot com. And we have a working relationship with them, which has been over twelve years, and it's been the best um, business uh, relationship I've had ever. These these brushes are incredible. I've had uh, eight series of sets with them, and our series number nine is going to come out soon. The rest are all sold out, but it's basically I I pull from their Golden Taclon line which is what I prefer to use and they're really affordable they're really good brushes they hold up and I back them 100% they're really good brushes Ace wants to know which surface do you prefer painting on I prefer canvas wrap panels I like uh, a cotton canvas wrapped over a wood panel so it's a stiff structure it's not going to bounce in and out, out on me and I gesso and sand maybe three to four times to get a nice eggshell smooth. And that's my preferred surface. I like a tiny bit of tooth, but I don't want it not too smooth, but like not too toothy either. Okay, I feel like, let's see, you answered the question about water splashes. Yep. I'm just going to go back because there was some, some question. Sorry for the fire truck in the back. Yeah, we'll let the fire truck go back. Um, about scratches. I'm just trying to find... Scratches? Like where you make that scratch effect. There's a few different ways. If you watched my last video, the rabbit season soup one, you might notice the background was stabby on it. The wall has tons of scratches and it's totally worn through. Um... I paint that whole section and then I come in when it's completely dry 
and I take some sandpaper and just sand it to knock everything back, scratch it naturally, take the paint off, make it look rough. Once, and then I'll blow all the dust off outside because I don't want that getting in my paint. Then I'll come back through and I'll start loosely, like kind of what I'm doing this, like tap in some transparent tones that will, that will fill up those cracks and just make it look weathered. I used to do some faux painting for movie sets where you'd have to weather the backgrounds and, and the scenes that they were working on. You'd spray on the wet paint, you'd wash it around with a rag, you'd sand it, you'd make everything look weathered and old. So I kind of apply those techniques to the paintings. And then at the end, I come through with like my little script brushes and just draw the cracks on. Like all these cracks you'll see on the head of Spiral right here. They all, I just kind of get some watered down paint and put the scratches in, whatever color is appropriate. Like some of them are really light yellow scratches and some light orange scratches. Okay. I believe I'm pronouncing this name correctly. Elijah Burke. Uh -huh. Would you consider videoing the palette during a painting video so we can observe how you manage the paint, medium, and mixtures? Oh gosh, that's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> My palettes are so messy. I've shown these before. So, I know it's not going to show up yet. I, uh, I lay out my colors. Gosh, maybe I should do a, a thing about that. It, I, maybe we do that for the next... Maybe for the next paint and chat, um, we can do something like that. I would have a lot of art teachers and other artists cringing when they see my palette. But all I know, it's worked for me for the past 20 years, and I'm not really feeling like changing it. I've had my buddy Nathan Oda, who's an art instructor at Otis Art School, he uses a piece of glass and then a wet paper towel. And every time he goes, he wets the towel down, puts the paint out. I think he has some on the glass, and he can freeze it at night. He has a very specific way he does his. And I'm like, I just can't work that way. I'm, I just lay out my paints in this old paint tray, and I know what God palette is I'm working with. And I don't know, I just make it work. You guys gotta remember, I'm not like a, an art instructor that has all the, the perfect right answers as far as like the schooling technique. I just know what works for me. I've done a lot of troubleshooting. I've done a lot of making tons of mistakes and learning on the go. I did learn um, illustration techniques and stuff in college. I wasn't painting in college though. I was just doing charcoal, pencil, ink, and a little bit of watercolor, but it was mostly like concepts and it was, it was graphite and it was, you know, design markers. It wasn't painting. I learned how to paint using spray paint and I, I had a lot of those techniques kind of just transferred over and I had to adjust a lot from learning how to paint with a spray can to painting with brush and acrylics. That's also why I like the fast dry time of acrylics because spray paint dries fast. So I have, a variety of different things I've learned over time just through making tons of mistakes. That's why I'm happy to share some of those mistakes and fixes with you guys. But there'll be teachers out there that'll say, you can't do this effect or that doesn't make any sense. Or I, I, I said in the last video about the instructor I talked to who says it's impossible to glaze with acrylics. And the thing I'm doing right now on these book pages is glazing in acrylics. And I'm like, so I can't do this? And it's just, I, there's a lot of like people out there giving knowledge I just don't agree with too. So I watch a lot of oil painters and I glean a lot from that, but I'm not trying to paint like an oil painter. I'm just like the look of how they compose things. I'm just trying to paint the way the acrylics work and they work this way. So I'm going to paint this way. I'm going to kind of piggyback Coco Ray and random cats questions because I feel like they are very similar. Okay. Coco Ray says, how do you uh, find your style and what was your inspiration? And then Random Cat says, how do you come up with ideas for your paintings? Okay, those are good questions. And that's the one thing that's the hardest to teach, but I think there is a, an answer. I generally, and will always tell this to everybody who ever asked me this question. You gotta just sit and think what inspires you? What are things that you always are drawn your attention to? And then you gotta keep one of these, or a bunch of these, full of every thought and idea and sketch. Like, there's so much that you can just fill a sketchbook with and make it 
messy as possible, it doesn't matter. As long as you have your ideas, take notes. I keep an ongoing note and stories I write in my, on my iPhone so while I'm out walking and things inspire me to write it down. But lately I've been keeping pages like this. Instead of just my sketchbook, I'll randomly just free, just free flow ideas. Whatever's popping in my head, I'm gonna draw it. And I'm drawing on pages like this so that later I'll find these things into my paintings. Like I painted a series of donut creatures so I'm like, why not just work out a bunch on these sketch pages so that later, when I'm looking to add ideas into a painting, I'm like, oh yeah, you did those sketches. I was just kind of free flow thought stuff. But I also grew up watching tons of cartoons. You know, Saturday morning cartoons every day. Just I would obsess over cartoons while at the same time, my parents had like books like by Salvador Dali on the coffee table. So me being just influenced by looking through those books, watching cartoons, they take me to the museum, we go to the Natural History Museum, stuff like that. They all work their way into my psyche. It, it's not like I intentionally said, I'm gonna paint just this stuff because it's, it's new and different. I, I just naturally gravitated towards certain aesthetics. I love Renaissance painters. I like to paint that with that kind of refinement, but my content, is far more kitschy and far more related to the cartoons I loved growing up watching and the techniques and I just thought they were beautiful like a lot of old Disney movies or I thought they were funny like you know old cartoons like Warner Brothers cartoons or Hanna-Barbera but I just thought the designs of the characters were great and I just don't see why I can come up with my own and, or incorporate theirs into what I'm working on as well. Cats and Hats Crouching Tiger says hello. When you start a painting, do you, do you just start on canvas or do you prime the canvas that's ready to paint? Beautiful oh, work. Love it. Great question. Always prime the canvas you're working on. Don't go to the store, buy a canvas, and not prime it. That little layer of gesso they have on there is not enough. I, I want you to do something. Pick up the canvas you bought from the store, Hold it up to the sky or hold it to a light and look at all the little pinhole bits of light you see coming through. That's going to affect your painting and, and the surface probably isn't even right yet. I would put a coat of gesso, sand it, coat of gesso, sand it, which is also why I like the, the wood back canvases because when you're sanding something you'll tend to see the line of where the stretcher bars are and it gets a little frustrating. But you could also just work on wood panel and then just don't prime that. I have a video on that on the Trekel site on YouTube as well on how to prime your, your panels. We'll put um, links to all this stuff in the bio for this after the live session is done. Clayton Levy wants to know, do you do portraits? Portraits of, of people? Generally not. I've done a couple. I, I, I don't tend to be as interested in, in painting too much realistic stuff. I will do portraits if I can put the people in my world. If, if, it's, if the purpose of the portrait is to place them in the outside, which is the world I paint, yeah, I'll do that. That sounds like fun. But in general, I don't oh, gravitate towards it. I know I can do them. It's just, uh, I painted portraits of my kids. Sam Luther has a funny question. Have big crayon lawyers ever been in touch with you? No, they have not. <laughs> there was a project years ago I was supposed to um, with paint a mural with um, some friends from LRG. Um, it was mainly, I think it was Pose, Tyke, Omens, Dabs, and Myla. We were supposed to paint a mural in Times Square and they were collabing with Crayola Crayons. You know, it sounded really exciting. I was super stoked, but the thing fell through and I was like, dang it, that would have been an awesome project. But no, they haven't. And I'm not trying to, ah, oh gosh, yeah, you're right. When I was thinking and coming up with my graffiti name, I never would have thought I would have ended up where I'm at. So that's uh, the big, long question. <laughs> it is a funny question, though. Raleigh Stewart um, has another question. It says, how frequently do you seal with medium before adding another layer? That's a good question. Um, it depends on where the piece is at. Like right now, this piece is pretty glossy because I did a bunch of washes with transparent red iron oxide and transparent yellow iron oxide, and those are very glossy. So I probably could have put a layer 
of matte medium over this before I went into it. It's not bothering me right now though, so I'm fine. But probably after this, I might put a layer of matte medium because if you work with a lot of glossy paint, you're gonna find that your subsequent layers kind of slide around a little bit. But uh, yeah, I, I, whenever you find your work getting too glossy, I throw a layer of matte medium on it and then keep going. Always let dry in between and all that good stuff though. Cindy says, I'm using a glazed medium to try transparent layering. I've also tried spraying with water before, but not getting the results I've seen you get. Also, I'm overworking and changing the area completely. Ooh, what kind of uh, glazing medium is my first question, if you can answer back. And then um, the water does work. I did almost this whole background just water. I wasn't using a glazing medium, particularly on this piece because it's smaller. I worked out my clouds in like light blues to, to a yellow highlight so I'd have different ranges going on here and then I washed it with yellow iron oxide which was only wet down. Well, let me just show you. I use, when, when the paint's completely dry and I have my underpainting, I'll spray it with this atomizer. They'll come through with a foam brush and just really squeegee it off so it's just damp. Apply a little bit of the, a little bit wetting down yellow iron oxide, which is, where the heck is it? Well, it's basically in a bottle like this. This is my Elizabeth Crimson, but, and then I'll take a big brush like this, which is from the Dollar Tree and it costs a dollar, and I will badger the whole thing through till it looks smooth. Let it dry, don't touch it. Once it's dry, I come through with another pass of it, maybe a little bit darker, add some red iron oxide into it. Don't touch it. Just do a few layers of this over and over and over again. And then you're gonna have that glazing effect. Um, gosh, I wonder what kind of uh, medium you're using. I have a video on the medium that I make, mixing two different mediums from Nova Color. And then my friends at Earl Lou Pour, they make a really good glazing medium. I use this too. Um, ah. Cindy says she uses Liquitex. Yeah, I've used that one. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, watch the video. Put it in the links of the glazing medium that I make. I find it works pretty good. All right. Let me go back up just to make sure that... Let me put some orange uh, highlights in here. Mikey the Keeper wants to know, do you prefer painting on canvas? or mural work and why? I prefer canvas over everything. Mural work has too many obstacles that you have to conquer before even getting it to the wall. It's like a big puzzle of how to get your image transferred right if you're doing a mural. If you're, and you know, what's the weather gonna be like? What kind of things on the wall? Is there gonna be bees and spiders around? Is it gonna be, how many days and nights is it gonna start raining? Are you on scaffolding or a ladder? Is there a lift, scissor lift available? How big is the wall? It's like, there's so many things. I really, and I really like having the canvases. I like a big canvas. I like like an eight foot canvas to just stretch out and work out my ideas I can spend months on instead of spending like, you know, days to weeks on something that's on a deadline that needs to get done for like the city. I don't know. And then there's the alternative, which I really enjoy, which I don't get to do hardly anymore. It's just graffiti work, going to painting letters with my friends. And that's more of like a luxury for me to get to do these days, especially with deadlines and you know, raising a family. So I love painting outdoors. I prefer it painting graffiti with my friends and then coming back here and working on canvases. That way I can keep the two separate and I can still love spray painting walls for what it, I grew up doing and what it means to me. And then when I come here, I paint my canvases and I love those for what they are and what they mean to me as well. Hope that makes sense. which I, I know I'm not pronouncing the name correctly because you had mentioned um, in there that you pronounce it a little bit differently. But um, wants to know, how many kids do you have? How old are they and what are they into? I have two boys. One is 13, one is eight. My 13-year-old is heavily into skateboarding. He spent a lot of time at the skate park. And he is very creative, very, very active. It's hard to keep him bottled up. And my eight-year-old is really into math. And he just, he's, 
he's in second grade and doing sixth grade math right now, and he boggles my mind. He's such a smart little kid, and they're both very different, and they're both it's both it's exciting to watch them both grow up and the things they get into. It's challenging being a parent, obviously, and it comes with its own set of changes you got to make all the time in life. But it's uh, I wouldn't change it for the world. I love having kids. Although they do frustrate me sometimes, but I guess I frustrated my parents all the time too, so. Let's see. Um, this guy 13 wants to know if you draw things on request, like say, for example, a comic book character or something like that. Um, I guess that still comes to the, the question on the commissions question that I answered previously. Um, it depends. Is it is it for a commission, and is it like something to incorporate into the world that I paint, or is it somebody just wants like a comic book character? I don't usually do that. It depends on if, if it is a commission and somebody says I really like this comic character, and if I like it too, and they they want to see it in one of my paintings, you know, then we would you know talk about how I would paint that comic character, the adjustments I'd make it so it fits into my world, the story I'd come up behind it, and why he's there. I usually want it to fit with a narrative. I don't want to just throw it in there without a reason for him being there. Like maybe he found his way into the outside, he slipped into another comic book frame and he found himself, oh my gosh, where am I at? Why are there dinosaurs, you know, flying in the air? Why are there fish alongside them? Like, you know, I want them to experience what it is to come into this world, not just to just recreate somebody else's thing, you know. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Craig wants to know, do you use plywood? No. Um, usually, oh, yeah, I guess it is first plywood. What am I th I'm thinking? I order my panels now, and I order them wrapped, and the company, I believe they use um, door skin on the canvas wraps, and then it'll be birch plywood for just the, the wood panels. And MDF is a good substrate, too, if you're going to wrap them, because it's, it, it doesn't warp. And if you seal it over time, it's going to be fine. I usually seal the MDF ones pretty well. Yeah. GC Begin 81 wants to know, how do you deal with the sides of the canvas? I usually paint them when I'm done. Um, like this one I have taped, because I know when I do glaze it, it makes a like a bumpy overlay, which isn't that bad because I frame the work. But I will, when I'm finished, when I finish glazing it and putting the varnish on it at the end, I usually come through and I just paint the edges whatever the main color of the piece is, or a paint of black. Andy C. wants to know, what other artists do you look up to that inspire you to constantly improve your skills? James Gurney is one of the best artists, I think. He did the Dinotopia series. Um, I love Caravaggio. I love looking at old master works. Um, Frederick Church and the Hudson River School guys. Um, old stuff like Hieronymus Bosch. That kind of stuff really pushes me, like, wow, why, how were they pulling that stuff off back then? Uh, it, it boggles my mind. Um, there's some landscape painters like Andrew Tischler, who has a great YouTube channel. He's just so fantastic with the way he paints. Uh, it's awesome. Um, graffiti works, uh, this dude Smo Nova from Germany. He really knows how to, to handle his, his craft and his, the tools at hand. He's amazing to watch. Uh, friends of mine in the scene, I love variety of styles, like Dabs and Myla have a great style I love to look at. I love people in my genre like Josh Keyes and Martin Whitbuth, Eddie Sal Andrews and Aaron Horky. Like, these guys really push me, like Dan Quintana. There's a lot of good people out there, really good people out there. Cog Art says, do you study and practice materials slash surfaces of objects to get that realistic look, or do you have one of those photographic memories? I look at, I definitely look at, um, what you call it, reference. Like, I'll even set up reference. I'm, you know, you've got to, if you want to see the highlights, right, like on a bottle, you want to highlight a bottle and look at the way the highlight goes in it, what's reflecting in it. You need to study those things to get it right. I don't have a photographic memory. I, I like to set up um, reference. And if I'm like painting a parrot, I need reference of that parrot to know where all the, the color changes go and, and where what the, the little feathers look like around the eyes and even what like the irises look like in their eyes. It's good to have reference. 
it's it's the best thing in the world to have a reference. Anybody who says they don't need reference, you know, to pull off like a fully like photorealistic kind of painting, it's, and some things I can actually do, you know, now I have muscle memory, but it's not gonna look the same. Like when I do the sketches, I use no reference whatsoever. I'm just going off my head, and then later on, if I want to apply some of those characters into a painting. I'll then search out a bunch of reference of those things and say, okay, that's how highlights look on a killer whale. Okay, that's where water droplets might look cool. But initially, I just go off my head with things that make me laugh or interesting, and then afterwards, I start searching out um, reference. Mark Godzilla wants to know, what is your favorite brand of paint? Uh, my favorite brand of paint is Nova Color. It's novacolorpaints.com. And yeah. I like it better than I like golden also. Golden's great, but I use mainly Nova Color. So, yeah, that's my favorite. <laughs> Good question. Um, Cake Sniffer wants to know: Will you be able to show or explain your paint consistency? Every time I lay paint on the surface, I try to move it with my other brush, and it does not move like yours. Mine just sticks. Sad face. Oh, here, uh, Cake Cake Sniffer. What brand of paint are you using? Let's see. Let's see if you get that to me. Yeah, sorry. I can I can answer this. And then in the meantime, let me scroll down. Well, I do have more of an answer for cake sniffer. I okay. use a fluid acrylic. If you're using Nova Color, use the fluid acrylics. Don't use anything out of the tube. Uh, this stuff comes semi-fluid. I'll hold up the Nova Color. Yeah, cake sniffer says li liquid text fluids. Okay, yeah. I don't know why. And see how fluid that is. And I put them in those bottles. I'll show you the bottles I put them in. Like a bottle like this. And it comes out like... It's... it's oh, yeah. It's really... It's a middle ground between fluid and heavy, but it's more fluid. And I put just a little dab of water for some effects. Depends on what you're doing. Like if you're trying to go transparent, you put a little bit more water or medium. And you can tap it in. I'm sorry you're having that, that problem. That, that sucks. It is frustrating. Lotaro says, do you work on various paintings at the same time? Or do you prefer focus and finish one? Oh, do you prefer focus finishing one before rushing to another? Good question. I only paint one painting at a time. And I work on multiple drawings in the evenings for new ideas and future paintings. So it's kind of like I'm working on multiple because the ideas have to come down in the form of drawings first. So I am drawing in the evenings for other pieces, but during the day I'm painting just one piece. I'm not going to switch over and work on another piece. I work a section a day, and to answer those people say how long does a painting take, sometimes I'm working a section this big a day. About the size of your hand, if it's a small piece, even if it's a big piece. Journey Travelers asks, what is your preferred drying time before dry brush highlighting? Thank you. Oh, that's, I don't know, I just wait till it's dry. <laughs> that's why you see me using a blow dryer too. It's not on fully hot or anything like that. I just want the paint to dry. And it'll be dry to the touch. So you'll be able to tell if it's dry. That's still wet. This is dry. You'll get the feel. The more you do it, if you paint every day, you'll know. It just, you're like, oh, that makes sense. Because if the, if the paint starts lifting off while you're adding your subsequent layers for dry brushing, that means you waited, you, you did it too fast. Gustavo Hernandez says, hello, greetings from Mexico. If I buy a print or a canvas, will it arrive in Mexico? Yes, we ship worldwide. So no matter where you're buying from, we do ship worldwide. That was a good question for Jen. If anybody has business questions too, please, Jen runs her entire business from website to, to any dealings with paintings, originals, galleries. She, she, she does it all. She's got a great wealth of knowledge, more than I do. I sit here and paint and listen to books and music. So she studies this stuff and, and has really good answers if you have any. Um, Caleb, I'm going back up because I apologize if I'm not able to get to everybody's question one by one as I'm toggling to see answers to Greg's questions if you've asked a question that um, slips as an answer. So I'm going to just go back just to see. Um, I, I'm sure I've missed people. All right, Caleb, 
if you're still on here. Caleb wants to know, would you consider yourself a postmodernist? No. Um, I guess my genre is called pop surrealism and new contemporary. It used to be called lowbrow, but nobody really liked that, I guess. Robert, Robert Williams coined the phrase lowbrow, which is like the juxtaposed school of art, which I pretty much fall under. And he's one of my heroes as well. And, but a postmodernist, no, I would not consider myself that. Benjamin Blackstar says, what would be the name of the planet your characters live on? Oh, good question. It's called The Outside. I've written about it, talked about it, I have a book called The Outside as well, and it's, um, it's my Narnia, it's my Wonderland, it's my Oz, it's the world that all the things I paint can exist in, and all the creatures fall down rabbit holes into, it's why everything makes sense and can exist there. Fernando wants to confirm, so you seal with fixative? No. Uh, I'll tell you when I use fixative. The only time I'll use workable fixative is after I put my either pencil line, chalk line, whatever I'm doing to transfer my image onto the canvas, I'll spray workable fixative, let that dry completely, take a coat of matte medium, and I apply it with this, let that dry completely, and I paint the piece, and at the end I come through with a Nova color, it's called matte varnish, but when you read the label it says satin. So it's basically a satin varnish that Nova color makes. And it makes the perfect seal. I maybe use two to three coats, depending on how it goes on, but it's my favorite. And if I'm painting an exterior wall, like something outside, uh, Nova Color makes exterior varnish, which has UV protection in it, which is really great too. And you can do that on any like surface that's solid. Um, I have a question from Kay Villa, uh -huh. uh, question for Jen. How do you sell and send artwork throughout the country? Yeah, definitely that one's more tricky just because, um, you know, what you'll want to do, depending on where you live, but find a company that does fine art shipping or that you know and can trust that is used to dealing with artwork, packaging it safely. If it's a large painting, you want to make sure that it gets crated. And they'll be able to um, ship it for you and package it for you internationally. So we have one that we use here, a uh, fine art shipper, but um, it's just really important that they're used to dealing with um, fine art. It's also important that, you know, depending on the price that you're selling the work at, that you offer an insurance option to your buyer. So that should anything happen in transit, it is covered by insurance. Um, and also just as far as the selling component, you know, we do obviously everything online. Um, you have to factor in, um, exchange rates, duties and taxes, depending on where, um, you're sending to. So, um, if you're, you know, accepting money by bank transfer, then obviously you'll want to talk to your bank about, um, how that transaction needs to look like, whether you're, you know, sending, your collector um, wire transfer instructions. I think that's probably the best way to go. I strongly recommend collecting the balance in full before you ship anything out. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, Elsie uh, wants to know, do you paint with acrylic? I know you covered that earlier. I think she just got on or he just got on. Oh yeah, it's all acrylic. Right now, I'm blocking in a, a sky inside of the book cover, so the sky represents another world that this character is coming from or going into, and I'm going to make it all cool tones to contrast the warmth of the painting. Okay, let's get to a couple more questions since we're starting to run out of time. Okay. Um, Do you have any tips for blending with acrylics? Um, I was talking earlier about um, when you're trying to blend an area, you don't need to go, like I'll show you right now. So I'm gonna blend this highlight. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put down an orange highlight because there's a lot of orange in the thing. And I'm gonna take a second brush that's dry and I'm gonna pull an edge off of it while leaving part of it opaque. 
and hence it's blended this orange into whatever this brown is right here. So you lay down with one brush when you're blending and you pull the edge off of it, if that makes sense. You're gonna have to practice this over and over again, it's gonna make sense. And then you let stuff dry, and then you do it again, you lay it down, soften the edge. So it looks like when you soften the edge, it gets more transparent over the layer underneath it, and it looks like you blended it into it. So it's just a series of, you can even do circles, it's just you blend the edges, leave some of it opaque, and then it looks like you've blended it. I will answer a question for Ab Abiram. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. Jen, do you paint? No, I leave that to Greg. I'm strictly, um, I'm strictly business, but I do respect um, painters, all of you watching and everything that you do because my brain doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, Ariel wants to know if we have an online course. Not no. currently. Um, this is probably closest to you'll get for doing an online course. <laughs> um, and yeah, we have to probably only have time for one more question. Um, but please save your questions because we will be doing this again. Hey, I'll leave in the comments whether or not this was helpful. And if you'd like to do this, us to do this more often, we will, depending on if you guys want us to. So just let us know in the comments and we will respond and make our decision on doing some more of these uh, paint chats. Here's one last really fun question that I, I, I kind of glossed over earlier. Um, it's from Bradley Klassen. He says, which of your characters are you drawn or can relate to most? I have this character named Ralph, which in my earlier paintings we called the White Knight, and we made a stop motion animation out of him as a kid. And he's in my painting, uh, The Good Knight, which is, he's like a knight riding a blue jay. It's one of my biggest pieces. And he basically was, I, I've written about him as being more like me, like he's, he's coming into the outside as a kid who's shy and, and, you know, maybe introverted and he has to go through adventures and stuff in the outside to find out who his true self is. So I always thought of myself as he's the protagonist, he's the one who has to learn about living in that new world. And he's been my favorite character. I don't paint him in all my pieces as much, but he's almost like the observer looking at all these new paintings and meeting all these characters. So it's through his uh, viewpoint that all these paintings are being made. All right, well, let's wrap it up. We will um, save this chat for any questions that we may have missed for next time. That way we can make sure that everybody, or at least almost everybody's question gets addressed, so I apologize if you got missed, um, but we will try to get at it next time. Yeah, and also, um, look forward to a, a new video, it's either coming this weekend or next week. It's finished, I'm just waiting on one aspect of it. So I have a nice, fun new video to share with you guys, and check out our website, gregsimpkinsart.com, if you wanna see some works or pick up some cool merch or prints. Have a good one. Bye, guys.